gonna do today, we're gonna work on today as one of the Mid-South standards. It's something common that we use. Uh, military guys use it. Um, Army, Navy um, guys use it uh, quite a bit. Marines use it. We use it in SWAT a lot. Uh, when we teach uh, people how to run multi-platform, i.e. your primary and secondary, your rifle, your carbine, and your pistol, once they get confident with transitions, it is different when you're running what I call geared up and ready to go, jocked up, or running Hollywood. Hollywood would be basically the way I'm dressed minus the body armor. Um, just running with the belt rig or running with a simple holster and a couple of pouches or loading out of your back pocket. That's still a viable way to train because in civilian lifestyle, I'm not going to be running around in my daggone tack belt and my freaking armor when I'm going to Kroger with the wife and the kids. Um, so you still need to train that way, but if you're a, if you're, de depending on the situation or where you're at or what you do for a living or the way you prepare, you want to practice in the gear and equipment that you intend on taking to the fight with you. So when it comes to cops, they need to practice in their uniforms with their, their you know, uh, concealable body armor and their normal rig, or if you're on SWAT, your overt armor and your overt rig. Um, if you're a civilian and you don't wear body armor, but you wear a chest rig or a Rhodesian pack or something on the front of your chest, you need to get comfortable using it and manipulate and working around the gear and the gun efficiently. Um, once we get transitions taught to individuals and we start working them from Hollywood into fully geared up and being able to notice the extreme, it's not super extreme, but there's an extreme difference from running Hollywood to this. This compromises the positions you can get into. It compromises your breathing, your respiration. When you're running and huffing and puffing, sticking on an extra 25, 30 pound plate carrier or heavy armor, is gonna severely compromise what you're used to doing without it. Also, working around this gear now, now I have something above the pouches, the gun, the rifle pouches that I've gotta work around. Um, so, big thing that we do in SWAT and that I'm big on is gear checks, all right? Um, if the equipment's not necessary, probably don't need it up front, uh, uh, encumbering anything you've gotta to get to on the front end of it. I've always been in the mindset, be thin to win. I learned that from a guy that knew a lot more than I did and I keep things up front or on my armor up front and up here on my belt that are necessary for me to be able to fight, stay alive, or patch bullet holes if I have to or add or, or aid somebody in medical attention to give myself um, aid. So I usually run it pretty much slicked on the front. Uh, when I was SWAT, I'd run double rifle, couple of bangs, O-lace bandage, tourniquet, tourniquet, and a couple more on my belt, and then my pistol and my rifle. I run the pistol and rifle the same way I do in comp or when I'm not running this, but I've got to be able to get to it. That's why I run my sides clean. So when I go down to the pistol or I go down to my magazine pouches, I'm not having to do gross movement. And people, when they start running two platforms, will start doing a lot of things that they don't normally do, especially once this armor's placed on that they don't do and it's not there. So there has to be a there has to be a constant flow of being able to work your gun, get to your secondary, reholster secondary, and rework the rifle again, whether it be a malfunction big stick or you're doing a transition and have ran dry and getting that handled. And then once you realize a pistol, you're through with pistol work and you need to get your big stick up and running, you need to be able to assess the problem. If it's just an empty gun, get it up and get it running, but you want to do it as efficiently and as possible. The drill that we used and we've taken away from the Mid-South standard, the basic standard is called the check drill. Or we call it a gear check or a all-encompassing um, <clears throat> uh, check of your weapon system and your armor and how you efficiently run it and work it as a shooter. So the, what we do at first is once we get them through transitions, we set the gun up to run dry. So we put one round in the magazine. So they load their rifle and then they have a fully loaded pistol. The drill is normally done at seven yards on the actual drill. It is on a four inch dot. All your rifle hits and all your pistol hits have to be in the four inch dot. Um, for most police, we don't run dots or small dots. We can, but I usually run it at least keeping it on an Ipsy K zone. Um, and then once you get more proficient, better and accurate, start working in down to smaller targets or striking smaller targets. So we're going to be running the rifle dry, transition into the pistol, engaging with one shot from the pistol, reholstering the pistol, picking the big gun up, running another mag in it, and getting another shot on the target. Now, this drill is for 
getting them basically working around their gear and equipment and it's a standard or a check that you can check to see their level of proficiency and the better they get and better they get around their weapon systems and their equipment the faster the drill will get. It takes time to get fast at it but once you're fast at it then you can start adding other problems into the drill. Unknown round counts and having to work the rifle and the pistol. You can also set the drill up for multi-target or multi-shot engagement. What we're going to do today is the base drill, what I'd normally teach a student once they're proficient at weapons transitions. So I'm going to get my gun set up, and then we're going to go over to the line. I'm going to run a quick demo, and then we're going to get uh, Chris in here, and we're going to work him through the drill and see how he performs as well and get him up to standard. So we're here ready to set up the check drill. All right, first thing we need to do is have an unloaded rifle. So we're going to take a magazine of one round and one round only. Now, like I said, this can be done once they learn the drill and the, and, uh, the standard and can achieve the standard, then we can start throwing little hiccups in there, like unknown round count on the uh, rifle, unknown round count on the pistol, and have them work both platforms with multiple reloads through it. This is the basic format of the way we do it. So one round inserted in the magazine, Going to let the bolt go home, do a quick press check, make sure she's good to go and close it. And then we're going to go and check the pistol and make sure I have adequate ammunition in the pistol and one up the pipe. So you can start this drill at the low ready or the high ready. Just depends on what you're used to using. If you want to run high ready, you can run high or you can run low ready. Most of the time it's from the low because that's what most law enforcement officers run at, but military runs at high ready quite a bit. So on the drill, on the beep, which I don't have my timer, but I'll get it out when we put Chris on it, nice and easy coming up. So once you get the signal to start, the beep, you're going to come up, fire one shot with the rifle. Weapon's going to go dry. First thing we want to do is apply the safety or attempt to apply the safety. If it's a malfunction gun, it may not go on safe, but even though we've set it up to be an empty gun, we do not want to trust that that gun is safe and will not fire again. We're going to attempt to put it on safe. If it'll go on safe, it goes, and then we sling it and transition to the, the secondary. If it doesn't go on safe and it can't be placed on safe, we bypass it. At that time, however you want to sling the rifle. So if you sling it straight down or you like to drift it over to your side, either way is fine. But as we're slinging the rifle and putting it on safe, this hand comes off, achieves grip, and breaks retention and we're coming up to make our pistol shot. Pistol shot is fired, come back, reholster, pick the rifle up again, eject the magazine, insert the next mag, which is a fully loaded, let the bow catch go home. Don't forget you've applied the safety. We have to take it off again before we follow up with our next shot and then go through follow through. Make sure the target doesn't need to be shot. And at that time, we can go straight trigger finger, index the muzzle slightly down, check and do the checks we need to check. And then I'm a big functions check guy, so once I apply it on safe, I check the bolt care group, make sure she's still in battery, close the EPC if you want to, and then we're ready to set up for the next drill. All right, folks, that was the check drill. Okay, like I said, once you get to where you're a fast and efficient, good economy of motion and running seamlessly between the two platforms is when we can throw in extra, extra um, obstacles to, to clear. Different round count or unknown round count with the primary and the secondary, working through issues and then getting back to the big gun again. Um, I'm big on if you're running by yourself doing an individual protection drill and never putting the secondary away. This drill right here is for becoming fluid and seamless in your transition between your secondary and your primary. And there's a time standard attached to it. You've got basic through advanced standards. The basic time standard on this is 10 seconds. So if you fully geared up what you carry to go to the fight in, you can seamlessly transition, rifle shot, transition to pistol, engage with the pistol, reholster the pistol, pick the rifle back up, get it loaded up and run it, um, and sub 10 seconds, that's considered a very good time. Um, the more efficient you get with your gear and equipment, and like most shooters in the beginning, they will start out overloaded on their equipment and on their gear, specifically their plate carrier, their chest rig, with gear that is not going to help you out in the gunfight, and they start figuring out, hey, that's getting in the way. 
If it disturbs your economy of motion or hinders you in any way, shape, or form of moving seamlessly between the two weapon systems and it does not need to be there, it probably needs to be moved. Um, I've seen shooters get down in the mid five to six seconds on this and even sub five second times, which is very difficult. But the more you practice it, the more efficient you get transition between the two systems, the faster the times are gonna get as well. If you get a sub 10 seconds time standard or less, um, take a good video of it and send it to my Instagram page, Ross4712. I also have two of them, uh, Rossfire, R-O-S-S-F-I-R-E dot S-A-I, all right? Rossfire dot S-A-I, that stands for Small Arms Instructor, all right? It's because everybody jokes about my small arms, not because I'm a small arms instructor. But if you get a sub 10 second drill or standard or proud of it, hey man, Put the video out on Instagram, make sure and tag me on it so I can get it and tag it to my page and put it out there. The faster and more efficient you get, the seamless transition between the weapons, the time standards are gonna go down. And if you can definitely get in the sixes and sub sixes, you're doing very good, phenomenal with your gear and equipment working that drill out. I hope to see some of you guys' videos out on Instagram. All right, next thing we're gonna talk about is transitioning between multiple targets, all right? Multiple threats multiple round engagement on multiple threats, um, transitioning between the targets. Now, the situation is gonna dictate what you do or what skill you use um, whenever you're running the targets. A lot of targets, if they're close, they're a meter apart or so, just like these, it's relatively easy to keep your feet based and use from the waist up like a tank turret and transition while keeping the feet based and centered on whichever one or whatever you're already lined up on and just moving and traversing like a tank. If the targets are wider apart or at varying distances or longer distances, you might need to do what we call a lean. Some people call it a tactical lean, all right? So if I'm engaging a target and it is at extreme distance from the target I'm looking at over here, turning on like a tank turret, there's gonna be a certain amount of movement that your body naturally will not be able to handle and you're gonna either have to shift your feet, which is bad because that, anytime we add movement, costs time. From that shot to that shot. And so what we'll do to help our body out because it's limited in its range of motion is develop a slight different position that gives us a cant to be able to get to that. So I might engage a target here, come to one center, but then I have to lean and basically take a knee and pull that knee inboard and I'm gonna have to use the muscles God gave me on the front and back to stabilize so that now I can torque or turn my body so I can get in the direction of that target. Don't always have to get squared up. I'm not a big squared up guy. I'd rather hit fast instead of worrying about getting my armor facing the guy first because even getting hit on this is gonna hurt me. So I wanna get there fast. So if they're relatively close distance, I can use the top of my body like a tank turret and just shift with minimal movement on my legs. But if the distance is extreme between the three, I am going to have to make an adjustment in my body and I'm have to going to have to do a lean and turn that knee slightly inboard and freaking use the muscles to help support. It's not a good stance to stay in for a long period of time. Once I engage, if I'm not sweeping back or I engage him and decide to stay on him, I'm either going to want to step back and get in a stable position so I can get a more accurate shot and line up on that guy, or I can step into the gunfight. I prefer stepping in versus stepping back into the unknown. I may not know, something might have got in behind me. I might be standing in front of something or somebody's walked up behind me, and if I go to step back, I'm gonna bump them. If I have to do a tactical lean, I'm usually going to step forward into the fight because I can see what's in front of me in my lower peripheral so that I don't actually step on something or slip trip and end up on my backside. First thing you want to do is get in your stance. I don't care what it is, comfortable. We want the feet wide and want that strong leg slightly back. You can come from either the low ready or high ready, whichever one's your personal preference. All right. It doesn't matter which one you want to go from, low ready or high ready, usually you're right at the exact same time and speed to get the gun out there, get it set, start engagement. Now, once you get ready, we're going to start on target number one and work our way to target number three and then work our way back. All right, so we're going to put one shot on each going across and then come back and follow up with one shot each on those. So it'll be one, one, two shots, one shot, one shot. All right, 
the theory that I use or the reasoning I use that is some people start out two shots, two shots, two shots, and it's always good to do that and practice that as well. But if there was three bad guys in front of me and I wanted them hurt and hurt bad or at least screwing their thought process up to where they were thinking more about getting out of there and not getting hurt anymore, than hurting me, I don't want to give them any time. So I want a good center mass shot on each one of them and I can always go back and follow up with that second shot. Okay. So since you're already on this one and starting your way back, you will just put two on three and then come back and another one on target two and the second one on target one. Whenever we come up, you're gonna come up, engage, work your way across and work your way back. They're relatively close distance. Keep your feet planted, no need to move much. The more you move, the more time it costs you, and I want to work and turn my upper body like a tank turret when I do it. They're relatively close enough distance, should be relatively easy. Okay. Do you got a magazine of at least six rounds on you? Yes, sir. All right, go ahead and insert the magazine, load and make ready. There's no time standard on this. We're not working for time right now, but I am going to go ahead and hit the buzzer, so the buzzer when I tell you stand by, I'm gonna hit the button, you're gonna get a three second countdown. That is gonna give you enough time to be prepared and working out what you're gonna do mentally until that buzzer goes. Once the buzzer goes, that's the signal to go and you're, you're live and ready to engage. Yes, sir. All right, do you understand the drill? Yes, sir. All right, shooter on the line, stand by. Good, all right, good to go. All right, shots are a little low on those. Uh, on this, because the offset, I'd aim slightly higher, probably up around the neck or the top of the A zone, and that'll drop you down about, especially with that high amount, you're gonna have four inches offset, automatically induced. Let's go ahead and do it again. Stand by. Good, good job. That time shots are right in the center of the A zone in place. Is that about the offset on it, about four inches? Yes. All right, good to go. Um, one thing that I find that uh, folks do whenever they shoot, and this is just my way of thinking through the drills. I like the Kyle Lamb one to five drill and any multi-engagement, multi-target target drill. A lot of shooters tend to want to count. And I tell people, hey, don't do that. They literally count the same round count that I tell them to, or that, I, that the drill dictates them to count. So if it is two shots, two shots, two shots, and we're just running from left to right, they will come up and they will go one, two, one, two, one, two. I don't like using that thought process because you're literally telling yourself to stop and start over again. When I look at those, if I know I'm shooting two on each, and this takes some practice, especially with high round count, multi-target engagement, is being able to strike the target and do a continuous count in my head. If I'm going to count in my head, which most people do, or they'll lose count on the targets. So instead of one, two, and you're telling yourself mentally, hey, stop at two, start over again. One, two, one, two, one, two. I try to move seamlessly and never let the gun stop moving. So I count one, two, three, four, five, six, and I keep moving through that just like that, and I move and I just drag the gun across, and when I'm in the target zone is when I press that shot. The faster I can count, the faster I'm gonna have to move that, that gun and engage, but a relatively slow drive across for that and still remaining fast is never putting that dead stop in your brain housing group and to continuous count all the way through. Uh, <clears throat> so. The way I'd count this drill, and I want you to do this next time, is when you come up and drive on target, you're gonna go one, two, three, four, five, six, and never try to let the gun stop moving. You're gonna have a brief pause, but you wanna keep the gun continuously moving. If I can count faster than I can move the gun, I slow the count down so that it mirrors the gun and the movement it makes. So if we're doing it nice and slow and controlled, it might be one, two, three, four, five, six, coming back across. That way we don't have a definite pause in between the targets we're shooting. Do you still got enough rounds for uh, another six rounds? Yeah. All right, good to go. All right, so this time, whenever you run through the drill, we're gonna run through the exact same drill, the exact same way you did it before. 
this time. If you were counting one, two, one, two, one, two, don't. Just count one, two, three, four, five, six. If you gotta slow the count down, one, two, three, four, five, six, that's fine. The gun mirrors what you're counting and you drive fast in between it. Now, when we transition between targets, as soon as you're done shooting on that one with the one, you know you're going to be moving to target two. The gun should not be leading and I should not be looking through the tube at the dot to get to the target. As soon as I'm done with that one, my eyes shift. I don't have to move my head. I don't have to move my body, but as soon as I hit him, my eyes are now looking on two so that I drive the gun. And if we train correctly, the gun will want to go directly where I'm looking. After I fire that one, the eyes are shifting and then I'm moving to that one. Two shots, eyes are shifting, moving. Firing that next follow-up shot on that one, eyes are shifting and then I drive it. That way the gun will know where to go. Instead of trying to, a lot of folks will do what I call for hunting for mice. They will hold their cheek to this and they will look at the side all the way across. That causes folks to tend to overrun the target. They'll run shallow or run too deep. So as soon as I fire my shot, the eye shift, I drive to that eye shift, drive to that eye shift, drive to that eye shift, drive to that. It makes it easier for me to get the gun aligned if my eyes are always focused. We're always looking forward to the next target before the gun gets there. All right, so we're gonna run the exact same drill. We're gonna watch the count and we're gonna drive the eyes forward first before the gun gets there. All right, shooter ready, stand by. Good, good, a lot smoother, not as big a pause on that transition going across that time. Big difference. Let's try it one more time, one more time. Got enough? Shooter ready, stand by. Good, outstanding, outstanding, that was good. Gun was moving the entire time, very little pause on the target, and we're always looking for that next target with our eyes, that makes it easier for the gun and the sight to find exactly where we're looking at and where we want to strike the target.